Hello, this lecture provides a discussion of structural systems and the components that make them up, including an introduction to the idea of load paths or the path that a externally applied load follows through the structure to reach the foundation and finally the ground. When it comes to building systems and components, these components can be grouped in many different ways. Um, one of the first ways you would group a component or an element is whether that element is a structural element or a non-structural element. Structural elements are elements that are designed to carry loads or designed to provide stability to the other elements that do carry loads. Uh, in contrast, a non-structural element is one that doesn't carry loads and doesn't provide any stability to the uh, to the structure. So, for example, a beam or a column would be a structural element. Um, a, a brace or a strut would be a structural element, even though it might not carry load. Um, but a stairwell or a, a, a railing or something like that would be considered a non-structural element. Okay, another way of grouping uh, elements or, or uh, components is to determine whether they're a part of the, uh, the superstructure, that's the part of the structure that's above the ground, or part of the substructure, which is part of the structure that is below the ground. Um, there's also a part of the substructure is the foundation of a building. If we take this mid-rise structure, for example, then anything above the ground uh, basically, any part of the structure circled there is going to be considered the superstructure. Anything below the ground level there would be considered the substructure. And then the foundation elements would be these parts of the structure right here that are supporting the structure. You might also consider these basement walls to be a part of the foundation as well, since they do carry a load. Okay, moving on. Buildings can also be, uh, I'm sorry, building components can also be classified or categorized as primary members, or they could be considered as secondary members. Primary members are members that directly carry the loads in the structures. So beams, columns, and tension members are examples of primary members. Secondary members are members that often don't carry load directly, but are provided in the structure to provide stiffness or stability to the members that do carry the load. So bracing, blocking, diaphragms, etc. So take a look at this. This is the uh, a, a picture of the new CBA building that's across the uh, way from ERC that was taken during construction. And there are a lot of bracing members in here. So these members here would be considered secondary members. These members are just providing bracing to the, uh, the girder element um, uh, to keep it from buckling laterally. So uh, if we look at this, this is a primary member. It's a column. This is a primary member. It's a, uh, a beam. Um, so primary members versus secondary members. Okay, here's another view of the same building. So in this case, we have a number of primary members, you know, column here, column here, a beam there, a beam there, beams here, here, and then a beam along the edge, beam there, beam there. Those are all primary members. However, there's some bracing that's provided in this region here, and that those bracing uh, struts would be considered uh, secondary members. We take a look at the same uh, part of the structure, looking at it from below. You can again see the primary members, the column here, column here. Even this beam is a primary member, but these little struts that are uh, shown in this view here are bracing members. They're there to help brace this exterior beam against rotation. So um, what would happen is you would end up with a load that would come into this member. And if it uh, comes in on the outside edge of the slab, that would tend to cause a rotation of that beam like that. Open web uh, steel or open steel sections aren't very good when they're subjected to torsion. So we put these bracing members in there to keep the bottom flange of that beam from moving. Okay, here's the same uh, braces shown after the deck has been installed. So these bracing members here 
are considered secondary members. These braces here are also secondary members. And again, the idea is to, if you have a load like that, that causes a twisting or rotation in the member, um, those braces are there to keep that member from moving, keep the bottom flange from moving sideways. Okay, here's a bridge section. So these, uh, uh, so this bridge is composed of primary members. So we have girders here, here, here. There's what, five of them. And then you can see these cross frames that are in between. And those cross frames, uh, most people would consider them to be secondary framing, secondary member. Um, not quite as clear cut as the other cases in the building that I showed because they do carry some load, but they're really there to provide a distribution of the load between the girders and to provide stability for the girders uh, uh, to keep them from moving sideways. Here's a really old truss bridge, and this is in my hometown of uh, uh, Russell, Pennsylvania. Uh, this bridge has been replaced since then. I took this picture about five years ago. It's just been replaced with a beam bridge now. But looking at this truss, um, lots of primary members. Oops, that's an eraser. So primary member there, there, right? All these truss members are primary members. But these members that go crossways are generally considered to be secondary members. They're there to brace the top cord of the truss for moving sideways. If you didn't have those bracing members in, then the top cords of the trusses would be subject to compression and they'd want to buckle sideways. So the lateral bracing, the cross bracing above the roadway helps provide stability to the trusses. Uh, those bracing members aren't really designed to carry any real forces. They're just there to provide stability to the, uh, to the load carrying members. They're there to provide stiffness to the system. Another way to classify members is to classify them as either rigid elements or flexible elements. So this is probably self-explanatory, but rigid elements are elements that don't go under any appreciable change in shape when they're subjected to loads. Uh, sure, everything bends or deflects or stretches or a little bit, but when you consider a beam or a column or a concrete slab, for example, they might deflect a little bit, but they really don't go under any appreciable change in shape. Flexible elements, on the other hand, are things like cables and membranes that uh, are expected to change in shape appreciably under load. Okay, now we talk about the definition of a beam. Um, beams are usually horizontal members and they always carry shear force and bending moments due to transverse loads. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of beams. Uh, so if we look at the different kinds of beams, uh, a girder is a beam that supports other beams. Um, if it's in a bridge, then a, uh, a beam that is particularly deep or large might be considered a girder. A joist is a beam that usually frames into other beams or into a column, and it supports the floor system or the floor decking of a building. So a uh, beam supports uh, floors, but uh, if you have another beam framing into to a beam, then the, that's not a joist. A filler beam is just another word for a joist, and a floor beam is just another word for a joist. Okay, so here is a uh, schematic view of a floor system in a steel, frame, steel framed building. So you can see that uh, if we follow the load path, through this, then the load is going to come in through the concrete slab. It's going to be passed into the, uh, the steel decking. The steel decking carries that load sideways in a one-way slab action, and then that's carried through a bending moment and shear force uh, in the filler beams until it gets into the girder, and then the girder applies the load into the column. The column carries the load to the foundation. So terminology, you have concrete slab, steel deck, filler beams uh, that frame into the girders, and then you have the connection angles and then the column. So these beams uh, right here are filler beams because they support the metal decking directly and they don't support any other beams. This section over here, this beam over here is a girder because it supports other beams. <clears throat> Okay, here's another view of the uh, College of uh, Business Administration, CBA building going in. 
So when we look at this, um, let me use the uh, pointer instead. Then these cross sections right here are girders because they support other beams. Okay, this section over here is also a girder because it's supporting other beams. These beams in the center, um, like, uh, so this beam here, 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 these are all filler beams or floor beams or joists. So um, they're going to end up supporting metal decking. These back here are also filler beams or floor beams as well. So this is an interesting structural system, by the way. Um, I'll probably come back to this several times during the semester. This is interesting because it has a unique combination of steel and concrete. It's not a steel building. It's not a concrete building. It's both. So you have concrete uh, uh, elevator cores over here. You have concrete columns in the foreground. You have steel columns in the background. And I thought that that was interesting when I watched this building go up. Okay, other types of beams. You have a spandrel beam, which is a beam that is along the outside edge of a building. A girt is a horizontal beam that spans between exterior columns and is basically there to resist lateral loads. And so the wind blows against the facade of a building, um, maybe a window panel. Then the window passes that load into the, uh, the, the girt. The girt takes a load into the columns. Okay, a lintel is a beam that spans an opening in a wall. So if you think of a garage door, there's probably a beam above the garage door. That is called a lintel. Um, a header is a special case of a lintel. If it's a wood construction, you put headers over windows and doors. Okay, a purlin is a roof beam that's usually supported by roof trusses. So you put trusses uh, spanning the long direction, then you put purlins that are spanning uh, perpendicular to the trusses, and then usually you have your roof decking supported by the purlins. A rafter is a uh, an element in the roof that uh, usually supports um, uh, the the, uh, the primary part of the uh, the roof framing. All right, this is, a, a, this is going to be a Marriott uh, hotel. It's been completed now. This is right up near Rookwood Commons. But what I want to do is zoom in a little bit on part of this. So if we look here, you can see there are a number of different elements in this uh, structure. So let me use uh, red, I guess. So uh, interestingly, here's a column section there. Uh, column section here. There are some beams there these beams in the foreground right here are special cases of girts because they're spanning directly between the columns and they're there not to carry gravity loads but instead they're there to carry the uh the wind loads from the facade into the uh, columns of the building where they can then be resisted by the structure so if we look at the cross section this is the girt right here and we know that it's a girt because it uh, frames directly into the face of the column. And then when the facade is put on the building, it will be welded or attached to the face of this element. And then that girt acts as a, a beam that's carrying loads that are perpendicular to, uh, to gravity. So that's what makes that a girt. Okay, this is uh, interesting. This is a uh, uh, the same building, and uh, there's a column that's coming down from the upper stories here. It's imposing a large column load there. And for reasons that I'm not quite sure of, they wanted to put a door or some kind of an opening right here, uh, right where that column line is. So uh, misguided architect, perhaps. So they needed to move that column line uh, so that it wouldn't uh, conflict with the door. So what they did is they put a transfer girder in. So this element right here is a transfer girder. And what that does is it takes that load and part of it comes over to this column and part of it goes over to that column. So there's a transfer girder there, which is interesting. Um, let me erase that. But what is also of interest is the fact that there is a secondary member here. This member there is just a strut that braces the uh, the transfer girder from rotating about its axis. And there is also a girt here as well. So a lot going on in that one picture. Okay, now you can see a, a better illustration of the secondary member there bracing it. The girt that's here that's framing between two columns. 
and you can get an idea of the load path that's coming here, this transfer girder spanning that opening. Okay, more types of beams. A floor beam, if we're in a bridge, is a transverse member. Uh, I mean transverse relative to the direction of traffic, direction of the, of the, uh, the roadway. Um, so that would be called a floor beam. Uh, you can also hear people talk about floor beams in buildings too, but uh, yeah, it's just a semantics, I suppose. And a stringer in a bridge is a longitudinal element. So here's a picture of a bridge system that's uh, being worked on. This is uh, obviously not in the United States. Uh, at least uh, uh, this guy here is tied off. This guy here is tied off, though they're using ropes instead of lanyards, so that wouldn't pass OSHA in the U.S. But this poor guy here doesn't have a harness on or anything, so we know that this is not in the United States. Anyways, uh, it's a truss bridge. Uh, you can see a truss over here. There's a, a truss over here on the near side you can kind of see. But these longitudinal members here are stringer elements because they're going in the direction of traffic. So this is a stringer element here, stringer element there. And this member, this member, these members are all floor beams. So the gentleman here in the foreground is installing uh, metal shear studs. Um, so that's going to help engage the concrete deck from the uh, bridge deck with the steel, make a composite section. He's using a Nelson welder. It uh, provides a, electric welding between the uh, stud and the, the deck. But anyways, if we look at the load path in this system, what's going to happen is there's going to be bridge decking on here, spanning between the stringers. So a truck or a car is going to put a load on that uh, bridge decking. That load is going to transfer to the left and to the right, and it's going to go into the stringers. Uh, that load is then going to be transferred from the stringers into the floor beam and then from the floor beam into the trusses at each end of the, uh, the floor beam. And then the truss carries the load from the panel point in the truss. This is a panel point here uh, to the foundations of the system. Um, ironically enough, this thing has probably uh, this panel point over here probably has uh, several hundred rivets in it. But we still would analyze the system as if it was a frictionless pin. Okay, so moving on from beams, a column is a vertical member in a building. It's usually vertical. What really defines a column, though, is that it carries primarily compression. Some columns can also carry bending uh, and shear. Uh, if they're on the exterior of a building, then they might have a girt attached to them and a lateral load or a transverse load introduced. So they might also carry shear force and bending moment, but the primary action in a column is compression. So again, going back to the CBA building, uh, if we look at this, we have uh, several column elements. Uh, we have the concrete columns in the foreground here. We have uh, steel columns back here in the background. So those are all columns. We would refer to, let's see, erase that. We would refer to these columns in the foreground as edge columns. This one right here would be a corner column. This would be an edge column. This column here, because it's stuck in the middle of the framing, would be considered an interior column. All right, uh, truss, you guys by now, after going through statics and analysis, uh, are familiar with trusses. Uh, truss is an assembly of bars or links that are assumed to be connected by frictionless pins, two force members. So some examples of trusses, you can see them all over the place as bridges. This is a bridge in uh, uh, Hamilton, Ohio, uh, crossing over the Miami River. And uh, uh, it's a good example of a worn truss with verticals. This is the UC Rec Center uh, be, while it was being constructed, and uh, this is a transfer truss. So up above here in uh, the area where you see this iron worker, this is a dormitory space. Um, and then down below here, I'll draw it in blue, of course, this is where the swimming pool is going to go. So they needed to find a way of getting these column loads out of the structure above and into the foundations, but they couldn't go through the pool. So each one of these column loads finds its way through the truss and then down into the foundations. So this comes down here, goes up. So we're following the load path of these members. So that's a transfer truss, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, help take the uh, loads uh, out of these upper columns, span across the pool, and then find uh, the foundation.
All right, in contrast to a truss, a frame is an assembly of beams and columns with simple or rigidly connected joints. So uh, members in a frame that carry more than just axial compression or tension, they also carry shear force or bending mobile. Okay, in contrast to uh, uh, beams and columns, which are one dimensional element, a wall is a two dimensional element and it's one that's arranged vertically. Um, so it's a surface element as opposed to a line element. It's a two dimensional element as opposed to a one dimensional element. Uh, walls are often used uh, around the perimeter or the exterior of the structure to form the envelope or the facade. Uh, and frequently, uh, walls are called on to carry loads as well. They can carry loads in the plane of the wall or they can carry loads that are applied out of the plane of the wall or perpendicular to the, uh, the plane of the wall. Okay, a wall that carries in-plane loads from gravity is considered to be a load-bearing wall. A wall that carries in-plane loads that are applied laterally, uh, parallel to the ground, <clears throat> excuse me, is considered to be a shear wall. And uh, a partition wall is an example of a non-structural element. It's a non-load-bearing interior wall without any structural function. And they're usually considered to be movable and they're considered as part of the live load. So a partition wall is like, uh, you know, a wall in a building that uh, separates the restrooms from the main office area, for example. Um, when I first heard the word partition, I thought like a movable, movable partition from a cubicle. But no, really, a, a partition wall could be, uh, you know, two by fours with gypsum board or it could be metal studs with uh, drywall as well, even though it's not entirely movable like a cubicle would be. Uh, it's not terribly hard to go in and move a partition wall uh, made out of uh, studs and, and drywall. And if we go back to the uh, picture of the, the CBA building again, this illustrates the idea of structural walls. There are several of them in this picture, and I haven't been over to confirm, but I suspect that each one of these is around either a stair tower or around a, uh, an elevator core. And these would uh, be part of the lateral force resisting system. They would act as shear walls to uh, handle any lateral loads that are acting in the east-west or north-south direction. But then uh, if you look here very closely, there are cleats where these beams frame in as well. So they're uh, load-bearing walls at the same time. So they're bearing uh, loads that are in the plane of the wall, both laterally and vertically. Okay, an arch is a curved member that carries loads principally by compression, uh, used both for bridges and buildings, probably more in bridges than in buildings. It's one of the oldest forms of structures known to mankind. This is the Big Mac Bridge uh, over the Ohio River here in Cincinnati, and this is a, a good example of uh, a, a, an arch structure. So if we follow the load path here, we would have a truck it's on here um, to reinforce what we discussed earlier that the truckload would be introduced through the deck of the bridge. Um, the deck would carry the the, uh, the load sideways transversely to the stringers. The stringers would carry it to the floor beams. The floor beams are there. And then at each one of these floor beam locations, you could see the cable. So the load goes through the cable up into the arch like such. And then the arch carries the load through compression down to the foundations. So load path goes uh, bridge deck to the stringers, from the stringers to the floor beams, from the floor beams into these cables, uh, from the cables into the arch, and from the arches into the, uh, the foundation. So uh, continuing this, this uh, these members here are bracing members, the, the diagonal elements between the two, two, uh, two arches rather. So those would be considered by most people to be non-structural elements. They're secondary elements, but they certainly provide, I'm, I'm sorry, they're secondary members. They are structural. Um, they, they provide stability to the arches uh, because in compression, those arches would want to move sideways up here at the top, but those uh, that cross bracing prevents it from moving sideways. Okay, here's another bridge. Uh, this one is over the uh, uh, Hoover Dam in uh, Nevada. And uh, the load path here is similar, but a bit upside down perhaps. So you have a truck load coming in uh, up here on the top. Uh, it makes its way out of the floor system, comes down through these columns into the, 
the arch and then the arch carries the load uh, into the, uh, the foundations. So in the case of the Big Mac bridge, the arch was above the roadway. So there were tension members carrying the loads from the roadway into the arch. In this case, the uh, roadway is above the arch. So we have compression members carrying the, the loads from the roadway into the arch. Okay, this is an example of the New River Gorge Bridge. And so we're starting to blur the lines a little bit between structure types. Um, again, the you know, load path here is we have a truck or something up here. Load comes down through these compression elements into the arch, and then the arch uh, carries it to the foundation. Um, so I would consider this to be an arch structure, but it's also a truss. Okay, so uh, the primary structural mechanism is that of an arch, and we used a truss to construct the arch. Okay, this is another example of an arch structure, but the line is blurred even more now. This would be a truss that is in the shape of an arch, in my opinion. So there's not a well-defined arch in here like there was in the New River Gorge Bridge, but the truss itself is an arch type of a structure. So um, uh, this is a deck truss. So if we follow the load path here, then you have a truck up here load is carried uh, into the panel points of this uh, structure. And then uh, the top cord is in compression and the bottom cord is in tension. So uh, it does act like a truss, but the arch shape of the truss is uh, uh, similar to what we saw in the previous few slides. So in the case of the New River Gorge Bridge, I would say that that was an arch that's constructed out of a truss. In this case, I would say this is a truss that's constructed in the shape of an arch. So, uh, yeah, also a deck truss as opposed to a through truss. Um, a deck truss, you drive over the top of the truss. Um, with a through truss, you actually drive it through the truss. Okay, floors and roofs are considered to be uh, two-dimensional elements or surface elements as well. They're usually arranged horizontally, although if it's a roof, it does have some sort of uh, slope to it. Uh, it has to have at least uh, a little bit of a slope. In the case of a house, it might have a 12-12 slope or a 45 degree angle or a 5-12 slope, which is uh, about 22 and a half degrees. Um, they are the first elements in most structures to receive the loads. So the floor system in a bridge would be a bridge deck, and that's what you drive on. The floor system in a building is what carries the live loads. You're going to walk on that. You're going to run your machinery on that. Um, they can be made out of concrete, uh, wood, or steel. Uh, most of them include concrete of some sort or another. Uh, although if it's a roof, then uh, sometimes you just put some uh, insulating board on top of metal decking directly and don't have any concrete on that. They may be supported by a, systems of, a system of beams and columns. They could be supported directly on walls, or they could be supported by a combination of those two. Sometimes uh, roofs and floors also act as diaphragms. I'll come back to that and define that in a few minutes. This simple figure provides an illustration of how walls and uh, floors act together to carry loads in a uh, bearing type structure. So um, in this case, we're illustrating a transverse load, uh, probably the case of uh, wind blowing against the windward side of the building. So that wind is going to uh, carry the load through deformation. Notice that the wall is bending like that. So the wall is carrying a load through deformation and uh, it's reacted against up here at the top by the floor in the building. It's reacted here at the bottom, probably directly on the footer. So the load carries that, uh, I'm sorry, the wall carries that load into the floor system. And then the floor system deflects in plane like that, as opposed to the out of plane deformation that you would see in that windward wall. Now this action where the, uh, the floor system carries that load out here to the sidewalls, that's called diaphragm action. Um, it's distributing the load from the windward wall where the load is introduced to the building out to the sidewalls. And now these sidewalls are carrying that load through shear. So those are then shear walls. So you have a windward wall at uh, the front here that's carrying transverse loads. It carries the loads into this floor system, which is carrying them in plane. And then the floor system, the diaphragm in this structure, carries those loads out to the sides where the load is then introduced into the walls that are uh, in plainly loaded, and those are then shear walls. 
All right, so this is a, a bearing type structure. Um, this would be like a, maybe a two-story office building or maybe a house of some sort. So we have some uh, uh, lots of illustrations here, and this comes right out of the tally text, so I'll let you review that on your own for the most part. But point out here that we do have a, a roof at the top and a floor uh, in the middle. The, they're both supported by joists in the case of a floor or rafter in the case of the roof. Um, and the primary load system here is that uh, the walls are going to carry the vertical load. So we have a load from the roof carrying snow or rain or live load on the roof. We have uh, loads on the floor here. And those loads span to the bearing walls, and then the bearing walls carry the loads down to the foundation. Okay, so in this case, you have footings. Okay, this is another example of a uh, simple floor system. So um, the load path here is you would have some type of a uh, gravity load applied to the deck, uh, to the slab. That load is carried sideways to the, uh, the joists. In this case, the joists are open web steel joists. And then those joists carry the load out here to the girders. And the girders are supporting other beam elements, in this case, open web steel joists. So then the girders carry the load out to the columns, the columns carry the load into the uh, foundations. So that's a load path. Here's another example. It's very similar to the last one with a couple of uh, differences. Um, load path here is you have a load introduced on the deck. Deck carries that load to these uh, floor beams or joists. They carry them into the girders, the one on the front side and presumably another on the back that's not shown. Then the girder receives or carries the load to the columns. The columns carry the load to the footings. So what's different about this from the last slide is that in this case, the joists uh, or floor beams in this case are uh, rolled eye sections instead of uh, open web steel joists. And these uh, floor beams or joists are actually supported on top of the girders so that you have uh, uh, a different elevation for the top of steel for the floor beams than you do for the top of steel for the girders. Okay, and then another example of a floor framing uh, for a bearing wall system. So this wouldn't be uncommon in low rise construction where you have plywood floor, wood joists that are bearing directly on masonry walls. So when we look at uh, skeletonized construction, um, this is a, a, a few examples, and I think I've used this picture in the earlier slideshows. This is a uh, example of concrete framing on the left where you would have moment resisting frames to carry lateral loads. Um, this is brace framing in the center uh, where you have these bracing systems here that carry loads uh, to the uh, ground, lateral loads. And then you have a shear wall system over here on the right. So load is introduced laterally and then this uh, carries the load down to the foundation through shear. Hey, this uh, right here would be an elevator core. Um, what we tend to do is put concrete walls around the elevators in a building, and then that separates the noise from the elevators. Uh, it provides a, a fire break, and it also provides lateral load resisting systems to the building. So that core wall uh, serves several different functions. It serves non-structural functions and structural functions as a lateral force resisting system. Okay, this is an example of a, a bracing system. This is in the uh, Steger Center. And uh, I took this picture on a rainy day. I wish I'd gone back and taken a better one, but I didn't. Um, so this is X bracing or cross bracing in this system. So you can see the, uh, the bracing members are just bolted up here at the top and presumably at the bottom. And so if we have a lateral load here, then this brace carries load through compression. This brace here carries load through tension. Okay, different uh, types of bracing systems, and we'll come back and uh, reinforce this later on in the semester. And uh, when, if you take steel design, we'll, we'll talk about bracing systems and steel as well. One of the challenges with bracing systems is that you usually want to put windows in the, or doorways in the structure. So you have to arrange the bracing, a structural element around openings, which are non-structural elements. So this often creates uh, conflicts between the structural engineer and the architect. Okay, and then a couple more systems, uh, a shear wall system shown here on the left that's combined with moment resisting framing. So it's a hybrid system. 
And then over here on the right, you have a bracing system in the upper stories uh, with a shear wall system in the lower stories. So uh, two different examples of uh, dual systems or hybrid systems in lateral framing. All right, these, this comes right out of your textbook. Um, so it gives you an example of some uh, different terminology, floor slab uh, framing into the, uh, the floor beams or the joists that then frame into the girder that then frame into the columns. The columns carry the, the weight of the uh, structure down to the ground. So you have an interior column versus an exterior column. Okay, another slide uh, right out of your textbook, uh, again, showing steel construction. So you have uh, some type of a floor slab uh, with uh, uh, made out of concrete carrying the load to the floor joists, which carry the load into the girders and then into the columns. So in the upper stories, the steel is uncoated. Uh, in the lower stories, the steel has been encased in concrete to provide fire protection. We don't do that very often anymore, but uh, back in, uh, uh, say, 50 years ago, uh, 70 years ago, they used to encase steel sections in concrete to provide fire protection to the steel. Okay, and then some footings are also shown here, and we're going to transition to a discussion of foundations here in just a minute. Okay, concrete system. The, the terminology is very similar, but not identical. Uh, so you still have joists um, and beams and girders and columns and such. Uh, but with concrete systems, sometimes you have a waffle slab system. Sometimes you have a flat slab system. In fact, the image on this slide shows a flat slab system. So there are no floor beams. There are no girders. The, uh, the concrete slab itself carries a load in both directions. It's a two-way slab. And then here around the columns where the shear forces in that slab would get higher, the slab thickness gets uh, greater. It gets thicker so that it can carry those shear forces. And that would be a, a drop-down panel uh, around the column and then the capital at the top of the column to help transition the load from the slab into the column elements and then down to the footers. And this is this uh, image out of your textbook that shows residential construction. We won't talk about this too much, but we will uh, touch on it here and there. Uh, it just talks about the different uh, roof rafters, the ridge board, the fascia boards, the, uh, the different types of framing that goes into uh, residential construction. All right, so now we'll shift our discussion and talk about foundations for a bit. So there are a number of different foundation types that are shown here in the tally textbook. So we have uh, spread footers on the left and the right, I'm sorry, left and center, showing a wall and a column being supported. And then we would have uh, a pile cap uh, supported by piles that is supporting a column on the right. So uh, over here, uh, we have examples of shallow foundations. This would be an example of a deep foundation with the piles. Why would you choose one over the other? Well, it depends on how much force is being supported. It depends on what type of soil conditions you have. If you have low forces um, or good soil, uh, then you can usually use a shallow foundation. If you have high forces or poor soil, then you need to have a deeper foundation. So this is uh, uh, out of the, the uh, building construction illustrated by Ching, and this shows uh, uh, an example of uh, shallow foundations and deep foundations. So over here is an illustration of deep foundations, and this is an illustration of shallow foundations. So the idea is with a deep foundation, you want to uh, put piles or caissons or drilled shafts or something down through the poor soil to get to either good soil below the poor soil or get down to bedrock. Here are some examples of shallow foundations. So you have an isolated foundation up here. You have a uh, strip footer here supporting a wall. You have a continuous footer here. It's uh, supporting loads that are coming in from these columns, but the, the footer itself is con uh, continuous across all those columns, so it's continuous. Right here, we have an example of two isolated foundations, but they're connected with a grade beam. Uh, maybe that grade beam is there. Maybe I know in, at UC, there are examples of steam tunnels that carry uh, uh, hot water from our steam plant to the different buildings. And in some cases, they've had to use a grade beam to get uh, a, to span over that uh, steam tunnel so that they could provide service for that. OK, a couple of other examples, uh, a cantilever or strap foundation here where maybe this is near a property line uh, and we need to uh, provide 
additional support to uh, the, the uh, strip footing along the wall. So you might put uh, that cantilever or strap foundation in there. Uh, and just another example of a more robust uh, cantilever foundation. This is an example of a mat foundation um, where if you wanted to use a shallow foundation, maybe bedrock is very deep and you don't want to spend the money on piles or caissons, then maybe you just pour a thick concrete slab uh, and then frame all the columns into that. And that would be a mat or a raft foundation. And then uh, here are some examples of piles. Piles can work in two different ways. Uh, shown here on the left are bearing piles. And the idea is that these piles are driven down to bedrock so that there is a bearing. Uh, uh, the uh, force transfer mechanism is through bearing pressure between the base of the pile and through the, uh, the bedrock. Uh, here on the right, is, these are called friction piles because they don't rely on the bearing between the pile and the bedrock. Instead, they rely on friction being developed between the soil and the pile itself. So bearing piles on the left and friction piles on the right. Okay, uh, in most cases, you would drill or uh, uh, drive more than one pile. You would have a group of piles, three, four, five, six piles together. And then uh, you would put a pile cap on the top of them as an interface element between the piles and the column. So load comes down through the column. It's uh, distributed to these four piles through that pile cap, and then it goes down through the piles into bedrock, or uh, if it's a bearing pile, or goes into the, the, the good soil if it's a friction pile. Okay, lots of different types of uh, sections can be used as piles. Uh, you can have an H section. Uh, or it looks like an I-beam. Uh, they call them HP sections, H piles. Uh, you can have a, a round section or you can have a concrete filled tube. Um, timber piles uh, aren't used as often now as they used to be, but if you're working in older construction, it wouldn't be uncommon to see a timber pile in a bridge, uh, bridge structure. And then here are some examples of uh, piles. You can drive them in. Uh, you can uh, uh, use a, uh, an auger and uh, uh, excavate a hole and then fill it in with concrete. So lots of different options. Uh, micro piles on the right, that's kind of an interesting thing. Those are small piles that are uh, drilled and then grouted into place. Uh, they're smaller than a conventional pile, so they work better in, in cases where you have limited access. And then here's an example of a caisson where you actually would uh, use an auger uh, to excavate soil um, and then uh, uh, fill it in with concrete with some type of reinforcement. These are usually uh, bigger, um, so you might have uh, four foot diameter, five foot, six foot uh, diameter caissons. Uh, so you only need one, you don't need a, a group of caissons together. In some cases, you actually would use the auger and drill into the bedrock by some amount and create a socket in the bedrock for the caisson to uh, provide additional uh, uh, frictional resistance and uh, additional support against movement. Okay, that's it for this uh, lecture. Uh, hopefully now you have a better understanding of some terminology that we'll use in our structural loads and systems, and uh, at least uh, an introduction to the idea of load paths. And we'll certainly expand on the idea of load paths as we move forward in the semester with additional lectures. Um, if you haven't noticed it already, you should uh, probably take a look at the glossary in the tally textbook. Uh, it's in the part of the uh, textbook that I'll post as back matter. It's in the end just before the, uh, the indices, uh, the index for the textbook. So take a look there. Um, and if you have any questions about terminology, that's a great place to start. All right. Thanks.